Yo, what's up everyone? In case you haven't heard, uh, my wife and I are here in the Philippines and no, we're not just visiting, but we actually moved back here to stay. And a lot of you have been asking about the show, wanting new episodes, and so I appreciate your patience. But it took a while for us uh, to get our equipment here, shipped from the States, and we also had to find good internet around here. Uh, but now we're all set and we're good to go. And I'm excited about today's guest on the show. He is Dr. Eben Alexander, and he's a renowned academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years. He's authored or co-authored over 150 chapters and papers in peer-reviewed journals and made over 200 presentations at conferences and medical centers around the world. And he thought he knew about the brain, the mind, and consciousness and how it worked. But in 2008, he went into a coma for a week and had an out-of-body, near-death experience into another realm that seriously changed his life forever. And he's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife. And his latest book is called The Map of Heaven, How Science, Religion, and Ordinary People Are Proving the Afterlife. And so, Eben, it's good to have you on the show. Well, Joshua, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Cool. Is it cool I call you Eben? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right, all right. You know, for me personally, for years, I've actually been really fascinated by this whole subject of NDEs and out-of-body experiences just reading books, uh, watching documentaries, and talking to other people about their strange experiences. And so when I heard about your book several years ago when I lived in the States, I, I knew I had to read it. And dude, I, I absolutely love it. And I love the style, um, especially your approach, because you kind of had the skeptic in mind, which is usually how my mind works. And right. you know, just not only that, without giving away any spoilers, it was such a, a moving story, right? But before yeah. uh, we get into your book, and since this is your first time on the show, I'd like to hear more about you know your, your personal story. Who is Eben Alexander and what was he like before the near-death experience? For, for example, were you born into a religious home? Were you a skeptic growing up? So just tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, I, it's important to point out I was very influenced by my father. My father, uh, he had been a uh, combat surgeon in the Second World War. In fact, he spent a, a bunch of time in the Philippines. Mm. Uh, and he had a very strong religious uh, background in his growing up in a Baptist church in Tennessee. Okay. Uh, he came back and headed up a neurosurgical training program in the United States uh, in the latter part of the 20th century. Okay. And he was very religious, very scientific. For him, there was never any conflict. Uh, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, like many people of that era. Uh, I came to believe early on that science is the pathway to truth. And uh, I would say I still believe that very strongly, but I also realized that the science that I worshipped before my coma, what <laughs> can be called reductive materialism, right. which basically says that the only thing that exists is the physical world, that there is nothing else, um, that that is false. And that's what my coma journey showed me very clearly. Uh, as much as I wanted to believe what I heard growing up in church and through my adult life, uh, that there was an afterlife in God and that prayer had power. Uh, I, over more than 20 years in neurosurgery, I started to have doubts and my faith was waning, huh. mainly because um, I, uh, I just, I started buying into the conventional party line of our conventional science that the physical brain creates consciousness out right. of physical matter. So for me, it was very difficult to reconcile how in the world can you have conscious awareness after the brain and body die. Right. And uh, I would say that during those 20 plus years in academic neurosurgery before my coma, um, I, I, I ended up not uh, reading any of those near-death experiences because as a materialist uh, scientist, I thought brain creates consciousness, so near-death experiences are a waste of time. There's some hallucination <laughs> of the brain as it dies off. Right. Now, my coma journey changed all of that fundamentally, dramatically, 180 degrees. And the thing people need to understand is the most important feature of my story is not that I'm a, a doctor who, who spent a lot of time studying the brain, but it's mainly the diagnosis, severe gram-negative bacterial meningitis. And my doctors had plenty of evidence from my neurologic exams, from my CT and MRI scans, from my lab values, that I had a severe case of meningitis that and of that severity it is almost uniformly fatal and certainly doesn't allow for people to have a full recovery. And not only that, 
because it specifically destroys the human part of the brain, the outer surface of the brain, what's called the neocortex, uh, that kind of severe bacterial meningitis is a perfect model for human death. Hmm. The only problem is it, it's nearly always fatal. Yeah. And that's why my case has garnered so much attention in the medical world. And I've been asked to speak at more than 25 medical and surgical groups over the last few years because they realize that my story is one that completely demolishes the simplistic medical pseudo explanations of NDEs as being hallucinations. Because in fact, uh, as I came to realize over many months of study of my medical records and then getting deeply into aspects of consciousness, is my brain was in no position to muster any kind of hallucination, drug effect, or dream state that would qualify as kind of an exotic near-death experience. The neocortex being destroyed gets rid of all of that kind of thinking. And that's why my case is such a strong case defending the reality of consciousness independent of the brain. In fact, right. I've come to realize, uh, as many scientists have who study this, is we are conscious in spite of our brain. The brain is more like a prison. And right. as, the, as the prison goes away, our conscious awareness expands dramatically. And of course, this is what near-death experiences have been telling us for thousands of years, that our awareness actually becomes much greater when we're not shackled within the prison of the physical brain and our consciousness is set free. And this is one of the reasons why I encourage people to get into meditation, why a lot of my work now with uh, sacred acoustics is all about bringing tools to people to go deep within consciousness. Because when you realize the physical brain doesn't create consciousness, but in fact is a transceiver or basically a filter that allows primordial consciousness in, we can all, as conscious beings, come to explore that territory and come to learn and know these deeper truths about the nature of reality. But we have to go within to do that. Right, right. And so just to clarify, you were saying that before you're, you're, when you got into the coma, you actually believed that the brain creates consciousness, that it's a pretty uh, common view among people you know, who are like materialists and, uh -huh. and basically... Uh, you had this experience that kind of woke you up to realize that the consciousness actually exists independent of the brain. I'm just trying to clarify that because this, this all happened what was a date November 10th of 2008. So this was a Correct. while back, right? And, and so I know you mentioned even in the book that you were like a pretty healthy guy. And then all of a sudden you got this rare case of uh, meningitis, right? Yes. Uh, so, so, I mean, so what was that all about if you were so healthy? Well, you know, that, uh, of course, is, is a great question. My doctors uh, uh, got, had consultants all up and down the East Coast of the U.S., from Harvard to, to Duke and uh, uh, University of Virginia, et cetera. These consultants were all in agreement that the workup was complete and that, in fact, they tried to find a reason for why I had gotten this rare illness because E. Yeah. coli meningitis is so rare in adults uh, less than one in 10 million per year. Uh, in fact, uh, wow. uh, E. coli meningitis almost always happens in newborns. It's very rare beyond the age of three months. Wow. So I had that very deep and profound mystery. My doctors never found a reason for me to have the illness. Huh. Uh, so I think just as it was a one in a 10 million diagnosis and a one in a billion recovery, uh, these rarities are there for a reason. And yeah. they have served to keep me focused. Mm -hmm. I couldn't just kind of give up, throw my hands in the air and say, well, I guess crazy things happen. Uh, because this was just way too strong. This was way too profound a set of experiences to go through deep in coma um, to just at the end of it all say, well, gosh, I guess uh, uh, crazy things can happen. Because it made no sense. It completely violated everything that I had come to know about brain, mind, and consciousness uh, over my career as a neurosurgeon. Right. But of course, as you pointed out, yes, I was very much a materialist. I thought all that exists is the physical world, the material world. <clears throat> and, and that was the part that was so strongly reputed by my, uh, by my experience. And yeah. so that was the part that I really had to come to some answer of. And I've come to realize people often would ask me when I gave talks about this early on, so that all-loving God that you talk about gave you that severe, uh, almost deadly form of meningitis? And I would right. say, no, 
I think that was part of my mission. That was part mm -hmm. of what I was to do in this life. And I've come to realize that uh, this is a spiritual universe. We are spiritual beings. Every bit of this exists to support uh, kind of the unfolding drama of our uh, existence on this planet. It's not an accident at all. This is all a very profound uh, and purposeful arrangement that we have here. Uh, but it's all about our spiritual nature, and that is the higher nature of this universe. And that is something that, that I'm coming to realize very fully. And it has everything to do with that mind-body discussion. The mind-body uh, debate has been going on for 2,400 years at least. Uh, it has everything to do with, you know, what is consciousness? How is it related to the brain and body and to our physical world? And, you know, all of that was going along at a, at a certain pace uh, in terms of religion and religious interpretation and the messages of prophets and mystics over uh, thousands of years. But then what really changed it up was uh, the 20th century and the uh, the arrival of of our realizing that the physical universe uh, does not have causality completely contained within just the physical universe. Right. That in fact, uh, we have to pay much bigger attention to the larger role of our souls and our soul groups and all of humanity, all of life on earth and consciousness beyond the bounds of this earth as being the fundamental reason this whole universe exists. Right. And that is something where I think my near-death experience helped me to frame everything I know about the nature of reality uh, in a much more solid and consistent fashion than I could ever do before my coma when I bought fully into that uh, materialism. Right, right. It's absolutely a dead end for our current neuroscience in terms of trying to understand the, the brain and the mind and their interconnection. Right, right. Because, you know, even in the book you mentioned on how even back in the day, you did consider those, you know, strange near-death experiences, you know, stories to be pure fantasy. So, you know, I know there are a lot of people who still have that mentality now, right? You know, so how would you respond to that? Well, you know, the uh, the, t the real reality of this is what we're talking about here is not just, you can't just look at it as our near-death experiences, hallucinations are real. What you, what you have to do, because what we're really talking about here is the fundamental nature of consciousness and reality, is you have to step way back and take the really huge view of all this. Right. And the huge view, uh, to me, makes far more sense when you realize uh, that the physical universe is only a small subset of all that exists. And in fact, that's where I would say our 20th century quantum mechanics and all the advances in science and technology really bring something important to the plate. Because before that time, the discussion was really around the experiences of people, uh, you know, prophets and mystics that were the basis of all of our religious beliefs. And then also, of course, uh, many of the kind of exotic uh, experiences like mediums uh, hmm. contacting the dead and things like that that were present in the late 19th and early 20th century that caused us to start rethinking this whole notion of, of brain, mind, and consciousness. But that's why that arrival of quantum mechanics and the deep mysteries of it was so important because what that actually shows is that when you get right down to the fundamental workings of the universe and the nature of reality and start looking at the subatomic world that makes up all of the stuff around us, what you start to realize is there is no material to the material world. Right. That's where the physicists and cosmologists of today would agree completely. Uh, vibrating strings of energy in some higher dimension of space-time, but it's not at all what it appears to be. And in fact, you have to step back far enough to realize that space, time, mass, energy, every bit of that is part of this beautiful grand illusion of setting the stage uh, in which we live and to realize that consciousness is absolutely fundamental. Right. So it really changes the game to have the uh, input from the from the leading edges of the scientific community that call into question the very simplistic thinking of the pure physicalist. Now, the other thing to mention in terms of near-death experiences as being hallucinations is anyone who wants to walk away with that simplistic thinking needs to be aware of shared death experiences. Now, in my many talks, you know, you mentioned in the introduction I had given 200 talks or so. That was before my coma. 
I've given about 330 talks after my coma, all about my experience, about consciousness, and all that. Um, and it is a, a far more profound mystery. Now, what I end up doing is encountering thousands of people out there by giving these talks who have had their own experiences. Hmm. And these experiences are very common. And it's not just the near-death experiences, which have probably happened in at least 15 to 20 percent of the population. But many similar experiences called shared death have occurred in people who were completely physiologically normal and were either at the bedside or they were our loved one at a distance when someone was passing over. And in a shared death experience, the soul of the bystander of that physiologically normal and healthy person gets taken along on the journey, even to the point of witnessing a full-blown life review of the departing soul mm. before they come back to this world. Now, I would encounter stories like that uh, on, on the road. You know, every time I gave talks, I would have a few people uh, sharing their NDEs or their shared death experience. I didn't know what to make of it until I read uh, Raymond Moody's book, Glimpses of Eternity, that I believe came out in 2011. And uh, that book is all about shared death experiences. It is Raymond Moody, of course, is kind of the father of the modern near-death experience uh, literature. He wrote his book, Life After Life, in 1975, right. which is all about NDEs. That's where he, he kind of popularized the term near-death experience. But that beautiful book, Glimpses of Eternity, that he wrote with Paul Perry, is all about shared death experiences. They are real mind-blowers. And, you know, that's where those simplistic medical pseudo-explanations, oh, it has to do with the oxygen tension, or the CO2 level in somebody who's dying, it causes hallucinations. You throw all that out the window. It's absolutely worthless banter that has nothing to do with the reality of these experiences, especially when you throw in the shared death experiences, which are quite common. I run into people all the time who come up to me and say, well, I never told anybody this before, but, and then they'll share with me a story that are near death experience or shared death experience, and it may have happened 50 years ago. They remember it as clearly as if it happened yesterday. And that is what is so striking about these memories. These are not memories of hallucinations. Uh, in fact, there have been several scientific papers written lately about the quality of NDE memories and how they are much more consistent with memories of actual events than, say, memories of dreams or of hallucinations or of imagination. Uh, and, and when you look at this in, in a scientific setting, which you can, uh, the evidence just starts to overwhelm you. Uh, and it has everything to do with a deep, much deeper understanding of the nature of consciousness and trying to answer that mind-body discussion. Mm. Wow. You know, I mean, that's why just even listening to you now, that's why I really appreciate, you know, your book, um, just among a lot of the other books that I would read about near-death experiences, because you, just hearing you speak now just kind of shows your approach where you are showing the skeptic where you, you do know the information and how the mind-body stuff works. And, you know, you're, you're, you're giving a lot of... Uh, it just sound, sounds more credible to me like because I, I would even watch documentaries of stories of other people, but they're just sharing their stories. And then I would just like still have s some doubts. Not that, you know, I, I deny near death experiences, but I'm wondering, are they just making it up? <laughs> you know, but then well, your, your you know, case. Oh, I'm sorry. I, w I was just going to say the advantage I have is by going around the world and talking about this. I get to interact with the public. All and right. A lot of the public have had these experiences. So. In other words, for the skeptic out there, we're not just talking about, well, did Evan Alexander hallucinate or not? Or, you know, or did um, Mary Neal, who, the orthopedic surgeon who has a beautiful near-death experience that she re uh, recounted in, in her book, uh, you know, did she hallucinate that? Was she, you know, underwater for 30 minutes and, and then returned to life and had a full recovery back to being an orthopedic surgeon, which is a miracle in itself, just like my recovery? Um, did they hallucinate it or not? That's why I think my story gets so much attention in the medical community is just because uh, it's such a tight case. You, when you look at such destruction of the neocortex, there really is no way that our conventional physicalist explanations of, of brain creating consciousness can possibly address that, can possibly overcome the challenges presented by my case. And yet there are millions of cases out there. And that's what we're really talking about. Not yeah. just a discussion of these these books, you know, what uh, the New York Times uh, book reviewers might call the heavenly tourism genre. What we're talking about is human experience by the 
by the hundreds of millions. Right, right, and right. That is these experiences that have a lot more in common uh, than they do differences. And that's what's so striking. And that's why the work of Dr. Bruce Grayson and others who study these things in great detail are so important because they have come to see the similarities. And the similarities far outweigh the differences. And these are similarities that are across all cultures, all ethnic groups, all religious beliefs, including atheists. Um, and uh, across all centuries and continents, going back thousands of years, the similarities far outweigh the differences. And that's where it's so shocking, especially as a doctor who would try and look at the medical circumstances of the people going into it and say, well, the medical circumstances, you know, what your brain is going through should have a great influence on what you experience. And yet that does not seem to be the case. The experiences are very common. And like I said earlier, shared death experiences where the people are physiologically normal and healthy are identical in their features to near-death experiences. So that's where it gets very interesting. Uh, and it's telling us something much more important about the true nature of being. I think part of the problem here is that people are so seduced by what, uh, what I often call the supreme illusion. You know, that all of the out there is actually out there uh, because you think you're experiencing the world outside of us. But in fact, the only thing any human being has ever experienced is the inside of their own consciousness. Sure. It's all an internal construct, a model of something we assume to be out there. And that's where it becomes very interesting because it's really the whole construction of that consciousness that we're trying to explain. It has everything to do with the nature of that reality, but what the experiments in quantum physics keep driving home to us is there is no clockwork universe. There is no objective reality out there, independent of the observing mind. Uh, and that is the part that is so crucial to get. And what I see all of this coming into is a synthesis of science and spirituality that will be unprecedented, that will actually make even the Copernican revolution, where we came to consider the sun as the center of the universe as opposed to the earth as the center of the universe. That was a tremendous revelation and revolution in human thought. But I would say what we're headed for now in terms of the synthesis of science and spirituality through the awakening that is coming to the scientific and to the world at large through this study of consciousness is going to be unprecedented in human history in its scale. Right, for sure. No, I mean, I, I mean, just so many years of studying even philosophy and even theology and all that stuff back in the day. The, the issue that I've always run into with with the skeptic would be the idea of consciousness. That's just that the, that's the the big problem that they have to deal with. That for me, even reading some books from atheists and skeptics, I wasn't satisfied with their explanations either. <laughs> you know, we just right. simply live in a material world. But you know, let's let's set aside the the whole skeptic thing for now, and and let's talk about your experience uh, in this other realm. You know. I'm sure what people would want to know is, you know, was it a very like physical experience where it's crystal clear, like the way you're saying things right now, or was it more of like a, like a dreamlike state, like a ghostly appearance? You know what I'm saying? Well, you know, the interesting thing to me when I came back, uh, for one thing, it's important for people to understand my brain was so devastated by my illness that I had complete amnesia all throughout my near death experience, deep in the middle of the coma. Never at any time did I remember anything about Eben Alexander's prior existence on Earth. I had no words, no language. It was really an empty slate. And of course, early on after my coma and trying to understand it all, I thought, well, that empty slate was expected because my neocortex was destroyed. Because I falsely believed, uh, as I did before coma, that memories are stored in the neocortex or somewhere in the brain. It turns out the modern scientific evidence on that is very clear. Memories do not seem to be stored in the brain at all. And that is a crucial realization. Our memory, our experience, our kind of soul uh, is not really slave to the physical world at all. Uh, other than the fact that the brain allows it to be manifest in this world, but of course the brain is part of the physical world. So every bit of it is really manifested by consciousness. Uh, and, and that was a crucial uh, kind of awareness to come to that was driven to me uh, through, my, through my experience was that, um, that our consciousness is much greater 
Uh, that realm, as I put it to my son, who majored in neuroscience in college at the time, when he came home to greet me two days after I got out of the hospital, I told him it was way too real to be real. <laughs> and I think that puts it in perspective. It was much more real than normal waking reality experienced here in the physical realm. To me, that was absolutely shocking. Uh, in a sense, all of it, you're not seeing with the eyes, you're not hearing with the ears, you're experiencing things completely uh, becoming through identity. Uh, other beings, groups of beings. In fact, there were times deep in that uh, core realm where I became the whole higher dimensional multiverse throughout all of eternity. Now try and put that into any kind of words that make any sense to a human being when you've experienced it. It, it, it. The words make no sense, and yet that's what the experience was for me. And And this is why we need to understand that our consciousness is far, far greater than what we experience in our normal waking state here. This is the dream. That is reality. And of course, when I started reading near-death experiences and, and my older son, as I mentioned, he was majoring in neuroscience. So when I met up with him two days after my coma, he told me, well, if you want this to be of value to anybody, you have to write it all down, every bit of the experience, before you read before you anything study, about right. near-death experience. Yeah, and that, that's what I noticed, what differentiated your, you know, makes your story different from a lot of the other NDE stories I've read, is that you did have this, whatever you call amnesia, where it was like a consciousness without memory. You didn't even have a sense of identity. You even mentioned that it seemed like you didn't even have some sort of body, that you were just there. Right. right? I had no and, body at all. So when I woke up in the uh, ICU room, it's important to point out, I had no words. I had no language. I had no memories of my life before. In fact, I did not even recognize my, my uh, mother, my sisters, my sons at the bedside. I had no idea who these beings were. Now, words and language came back very quickly, literally within hours and days. Um, and, and then all my other memories of childhood over a few weeks, my memories of all those decades spent in neurosurgery came back over about eight weeks or so. So by two months, I was pretty much back. And people would often ask me, well, are you 90% or 95%? And I would often say, well, you know, it really feels like I'm about 110%. Back. <laughs> Things were even better than before. And to this day, my doctors have absolutely no explanation for my recovery. I mean, I mean, by the end of my illness, by the end of that week in coma, I was down to only a 2% chance of survival. And at that point, they estimated even if I did survive, uh, I would be a wreck. I'd be in a nursing home in coma and die there a few months later. That's when my doctors recommended just stopping the antibiotics. And of course, it was a few hours after that recommendation, I started coming back to this world. Hmm. Uh, but the, the only thing I knew at that time was what I remembered from deep within coma. Right, And right. that was the extraordinary story that I share in proof of heaven right uh, so, so how did that really work then because you even mentioned in the book about how like like language and emotion and logic like they were pretty much all gone so how in your experience in that other realm like how did you communicate and receive messages then it, it's uh it's in a much more profound way it's through identity really we become uh, other aspects we become other beings and you know in that core realm uh, that was the, the, the oneness, and that was absolutely uh, as far from human description as you can be, and yet in reading many near-death experiences and, and uh, reports of mystics and prophets, etc., uh, what I came to realize is so many have been there, and we can even do it through meditation. This is why I'm such a big proponent of meditation. We can get to that infinite sense of pure love and oneness uh, by going very deeply within, but it certainly involves leaving the ego far behind, and that includes the linguistic voice. Remember that the little voice in your head uh, is a tiny part of a, a brain function. Um, in fact, uh, we call that the dominant hemisphere because that's where language lives, and yet it's only uh, two regions about the size of the end of your, of your little finger uh, that both create speech and then interpret speech. And that little voice is also deeply tied to our ideas of self and to the, the ego. Uh, and none of that is your ally in going within and, and in getting into this oneness. And that's why um, I often remind people that your consciousness is not the little voice in your head, but it's your awareness. And that's what we're trying to help people to uh, develop and evolve and uh, to nurture is that awareness and that's why these tones from sacred acoustics are so 
uh, important because they can help people who are not, uh, you know, acclimated to uh, a very facile use of meditative states. Uh, and these tones can help people go deep within and help silence that little voice because often the little voice, you know, the same voice of rational and logical communication between humans just gets in the way, you know, like, am I doing this right? Or, you know, I, uh, going through a grocery list or <laughs> thinking about the day's activities as opposed to just letting go and going deep within and finding that within our consciousness, there is far greater wisdom than just that little voice of our rational, logical, um, you know, linguistic brain. And that, that, of course, is a very linear processing unit as opposed to deep in these realms where we become all of this. As I said earlier, you're not seeing with the eyes, hearing with the ears. Your brain is no longer serving as a filter. So you are running into consciousness, universal, primordial, infinite consciousness, full on. And that is a very, very powerful thing to go through. And that's why it changes people's lives. People come back from this, even atheists have a profound near-death experience, and they come back, they never fear death again. They never doubt the reality of the spiritual realm and of our spiritual being. They also come to see the infinite healing power of that unconditional love. And of course, unconditional love, uh, that phrase gets thrown around a lot and it loses a lot of its meaning just because of its overuse. But the big power is in experiencing that. And that's why I encourage people to meditate and go within. People can go to sacredacoustics.com to learn more, get some of the tools available. But this is all about coming to realize that our consciousness is a far more profound mystery than just some little accidental epiphenomenon arising from the physical workings of the brain. Because in fact, if you get right into it, if you Google the hard problem of consciousness, what you will find is the deepest enigma of all of modern human thought is that whole mind-body discussion and the relationship between our conscious experience and memory and the physical world and the brain. And in fact, in modern neuroscience, what you find is no one, no neuroscientist, no philosopher of mind on earth has the remotest clue how to explain how the physical brain could give rise to consciousness. And the reason is it does not. And yet one of the biggest uh, uh, travesties of this situation is that much of our modern materialist conventional science is built on the notion that all that exists is the physical. And therefore, the physical brain must somehow create consciousness out of physical matter. That is all false. That is the hard problem of consciousness. And the reality is it's an impossible problem if you're trying to solve it completely from within the physical world and looking as the brain is the creator. Right, right. You know, it's interesting because I, I don't know if you remember in the email, like the guest following after you is actually uh, Dean Radin. And yeah, so, you see, know, he's, he's very good at studying this in a scientific fashion. Right, like the scientific stuff with the experimentation and even talking a lot about yoga and meditation. And, and so I, you know, can confirm just a lot of the stuff that you're saying because just even for myself and my wife and, you know, we're really big on meditation and just even some from some of our own experiences that we've had of, of just this feeling of uh, feeling oneness and transcendence and, you know, people healing their bodies. And even I had my own story of my body being healed and they're just... There's just a lot of things that people don't realize the the power of um, awareness as we you know just look within and we just tap into these so-called powers <laughs> that we have yes. you know to heal yes. our to heal our bodies well, you know yeah um, it's it's uh, it's really uh, I think it's going to revolutionize so many aspects of of humanity. Uh, one of them, of course, is health, right. health care, uh, because in fact, from my point of view, given that we are spiritual beings first and foremost. Um, to me, as a doctor, uh, I get out there very strongly, you know, if you want physical, mental, emotional health, you really have to start with spiritual health. And, you know, modern medicine has spent decades uh, kind of recognizing placebo effect is very powerful. In fact, in the modern scientific medical world, uh, placebo effect is basically... Uh, if you had to pick a figure, you'd say about 30% of the benefit of a treatment uh, is placebo effect. Now, it depends a lot, of course, on what the, what the uh, illness or, or symptom is, uh, but the reality is placebo effect is extremely powerful. Uh, big Pharma does not like that because they have to somehow overcome that 30% benefit in a lot of their drug studies, which they know is very difficult to do. And, 
In fact, what I would say is I've come to realize that the placebo effect is probably much more powerful than just that 30%. Once we uh, start developing our ability to use it, that is through the power of prayer, through going within, uh, through getting in touch with our deeper spiritual selves and our spiritual journey, seeing that the highest good is always the path to follow, coming to love ourselves truly. Uh, because in fact, you know, I grew up in a Christian uh, uh, background, so I was always taught, you know, love yourself, love your uh, neighbor, love your enemy. Uh, well, the truth of the matter is, given that we're all part of one consciousness, loving others is loving ourselves. Uh, but at, at the most superficial uh, starting level, we really, most of the problems in this world, I think, come from our lo not loving ourselves enough. And we need to realize that we're eternal spiritual beings and we are worthy of that infinite love that we should shower on ourselves. And the best way to actually manifest that is to love others, love our neighbors, love our, quote, enemies. I came to see that many who I had seen before my coma as a, quote, enemy or nemesis were actually near and dear soul mates, part of my um, soul uh, cluster. Uh, and that was all about teaching each other especially difficult lessons. And that's why I saw them as an opponent in some fashion. But it was by broadening my point of view, realizing that love for myself, love for others, including that opponent, um, and showing compassion, forgiveness, acceptance, mercy. This is how we can mature most as a spiritual being, come to the greatest spiritual health, and that helps us to come to the greatest physical, mental, and emotional health. But it's all through that infinite healing power of unconditional love. And once we begin to love ourselves truly and serve as a conduit for that love, which we can do through meditation, uh, loving others. And for me, when I talk about meditation, especially the sacred acoustic sound guided kind of meditation, it really is a form of centering prayer that fully acknowledges the oneness of all life, the oneness of all beings, that we're all in this together, and that the higher good is what is always best for my own good, uh, you know, in terms of advancing as a soul, given that we're all interconnected. And so it just makes perfect sense to follow that. But if, if people need a practical reason to do so, it's because it can give you much greater true health. Uh, and if you're meant to heal from a particular physical injury or illness in this incarnation, uh, deep prayer, meditation, uh, mind over matter, focus within meditation of that infinite healing power of love are the ways to come to that healing if it's meant to be in this incarnation. Of course, the other part of the package uh, is that we come here many times. Reincarnation is absolutely real. That is something I wouldn't have paid any attention to. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, same here. Uh, but since my coma, I've come to realize it's absolutely fundamentally part of uh, who we are. For the Christians out there who have trouble accepting reincarnation, I would steer them to the beautiful book by Dr. Herbert Perrier called Why Jesus Taught Reincarnation. It's a beautiful book that hits it's the nail right on the head that that reincarnation is part of original Christianity, but it is not part that was uh, put in there by the patriarchal committees uh, in, in later centuries, uh, but it is certainly consistent with the original uh, teachings of Christ. And with all the other great faiths. Yeah, even our previous guest was a Dr. Amit Goswami, and he actually talks a lot about reincarnation as well. And a uh, very brilliant guy. You know, but we even just to come back to this whole idea of unconditional love, which is usually associated or synonymous with God. You know, um, did you, just to go back to your experience, did you encounter what people typically is describe as God? Yes, absolutely. And in a beautiful way. Um, you know, the experience that I report in Proof of Heaven started out in that earth where my view, that very primitive, coarse, unresponsive realm uh, that is frightening to some people. Uh, it was not really so frightening to me because I had no memory of anything else. So to me, it was just the, the way existence is. But then uh, I was rescued from that by that slowly spinning white light with a perfect musical melody that led me up into the Gateway Valley, that ultra real valley that was filled with earthly features like flowers, uh, buds on trees, uh, lush growth, uh, uh, waterfalls, sparkling pools, uh, you know, thousands of souls dancing below and lots of joy and merriment. I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing with a beautiful girl who ended up being a profoundly important uh, teacher, uh, especially in the months after my coma of showing me the reality of the journey. Uh, and then, 
you know, the angelic choirs above in that realm served as yet another musical portal up into higher realms all the way out to that core realm. Now, my first awareness of the divine, remember that I was completely amnesic. I was empty slate when I started this experience. So my first awareness of the divine was a soft summer breeze when I was in that gateway valley on the butterfly wing with a beautiful girl. And that breeze to me, as I wrote it up later, was like the breath of God, divine wind. And that was uh, so refreshing and liberating because it was coming to me with that beautiful message from my companion on the butterfly wing, uh, the beautiful woman saying, you are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You will be taken care of. Um, and so that divine wind to me was very profound. And then, of course, the angelic choirs providing that portal into higher and higher realms, seeing all of space and time collapse, even deep time in the spiritual realm of causality collapsing down, all the way out to that oneness of the core. And uh, in that, that where the entire higher dimensional multiverse had been shrunken down to this incredibly complex oversphere that was there to serve as a teaching point, uh, to help teach me various lessons, but that was all with that indescribable presence of, of unconditional love, completely filling infinity and eternity and overflowing. That love cannot possibly be put into any kind of human words that makes sense. And again, this is the reason I encourage people to go there. This was something that to me was so shocking when I started reading other near-death experiences and hearing of them, of those experiences from members of my audiences, because I started to then really sense the commonality of the power of that unconditional love and that feeling. That's what many of us would then come back and say that was God, that is God. God is basically the source of our very consciousness. And given that consciousness is the source of all that emerges in the physical reality, that God is uh, the creator uh, and prime mover of all of that. And yet, as I point out in Proof of Heaven, the interesting thing is how deeply personal that God is. It's sh that God shows us uh, that we are essentially connected with that God. And it's really only by forgetting that divine connection that uh, all of the badness creeps into this world. But all that is part of our growth. It's intentional. It's part of what we must go through. There are reasons why we don't come in here fully knowing what our higher souls know about our existence and our soul groups between lives. And that is uh, such a crucial part of understanding that this is all part of the purpose. So as much as I often talk about this material world and this four-dimensional space-time that we live our normal waking reality in as an illusion, it's also the reason the whole universe exists is to support that stage on which this drama unfolds, the drama of our human interactions. That's what this soul school is all about. We're all here to learn and teach these lessons. And most ideally, if we want to follow the most direct pathway of ascendance of our soul groups towards oneness with the divine, is in all the choices we make in this life, they are choices made out of love, compassion, forgiveness, acceptance, and mercy for ourselves and for all fellow beings. And that is what leads us most directly towards that oneness. But God loves us so much as to give us the gift of free will. And free will allows us to deviate from that path. So we can choose to uh, be selfish or greedy, uh, you know, let our ego uh, run free uh, in ways that don't honor other beings and honor the oneness of all. And if we do that, we are simply taking a much more arduous pathway. Because if we do not make amends for such selfishness and greed and for inflicting pain and suffering on others in this incarnation, then we have to go through it in our life review. You know, that old saying, your life flashes before your eyes. Well, that is not some new age concept. That is something that goes back thousands of years. Prophets, uh, mystics, uh, spiritual journeyers for ages have talked about that life review when we leave the physical body. Uh, and all that is done in the presence of our higher soul and our, our soul groups, you know, the soul members who have already departed the physical plane, all part of uh, uh, planning the next incarnation. Uh, but that life review is a very crucial uh, demonstrator of kind of the false nature of the here and now that we're tricked into believing when we're down here on the stage that is set in the material world. And these are all crucial concepts to kind of getting the higher order of existence and how all this works. You know, just even me um, reading a lot about different near-death experiences and, 
you know, there is a lot of things in common that they have, such as the bright light, you know, the, the tunnel, the life review, you know, they see their whole life flash right before them, you know, but I know one question that would come up in people's minds because for you, you're claiming to have seen heaven, which is a beautiful thing, right? Where you, you experience this unconditional love and you experience this oneness with, with even God, yes. right? So, but well, I know what uh, one question that would pop up for people is, well, you saw heaven, but what about hell though? Is hell real too? <laughs> Well, you know, if, if I had just gone to that earthworm eye view, which is where my coma journey began, and if I had come back from there to this world, if I had awakened from that, and that was the extent of my journey, I would have had a hellish near-death experience. Sure. Uh, if you look at the literature, the general numbers are that the hellish NDEs are maybe a 3% or 4%. Uh, it's a low number. I think that that uh, number probably in reality is higher because you know, people by and large tend not to report near-death experiences. That's why when we say that 15% of the general population, 15 to 20% have had near-death experiences, that number is also probably higher because they are underreported. People don't volunteer this. You usually have to be asking them. Uh, and it's even worse for a hellish NDE. Now, a hellish NDE, often when you read them, uh, they often basically involve a very hellish life review. And that's because that person had lived a life where they were very greedy and selfish and handing out a lot of pain and suffering to others. So their life review was very hellish. People often ask me, well, what about Hitler? Did, uh, you know, has he just danced into heaven like everybody else? And I would say, well, uh, if you want to call it dancing, but remember that he had to go through a life review. And the life review, you have to become the others that were influenced by your decisions. It's a beautiful life review. It's a beautiful example of how the boundaries of self are false. They're illusory. They're part of the construct of the soul school. And so, in a life review, you actually become those others around you who were influenced by your decisions. Now, from Hitler's standpoint, that becomes a very difficult problem because not only uh, does he have to go through in his life review becoming all of those physical victims of the 53 million people who died during World War II but of all souls who ever knew of his transgressions. Because this is all about not only our actions, but our thoughts. And so there's a very, very strong sense of kind of karma that, uh, in fact, you reap what you sow. We don't get off scot-free. And, and the other uh, important lesson there is, you know, the teaching in my Christian church growing up that you could be a very bad person your whole life. And then if the at the end of your life, you said, well, Jesus Except is my Jesus. Savior, then you're forgiven, and yeah. then uh, it's all, you know, then you dance right into heaven. That is not the way the real world works from my experience. It's all very deeply driven by, by cause and effect and by a balance and justice. So if we can a lot of pain and suffering to others, we're going to have to feel that. And that's why it's much better to make amends in this life so you don't have to go through that in your life review. So in other words, you're just saying that what we do now really, really matters. <laughs> you know, it it we... all matters. And, and just remember, the important thing is it, it, it's all important because we're all part of the evolution of consciousness. Each and every one of us is part of this tremendous process that uh, Tillard de Chardin um, wrote about. And that is that uh, all of consciousness is evolving throughout the universe. And this is very much a conscious universe. Uh, it's not a material universe that's dead and unaware. It's absolutely riddled with self-awareness. Consciousness fundamentally permeates all that is. And that is part of, of what we can all come to know. But our, our journeys here are very important, and they have everything to do with that love. I mean, this is obviously not a new lesson. It's an ancient lesson. But this world has not necessarily done a very good job of learning that lesson. And that's what I think is changing now. I think the awakening that is coming to this world is going to be unprecedented and it's going to be wonderful for all souls because it is really all about the oneness we share and about manifesting this love, compassion, and forgiveness for all fellow beings. Right, right. Well, that's good. I mean, you know, just because for the sake of time, though, do you mind sharing a little bit about your, your second book, The Map of Heaven? Yes, well, the, yeah, I think The Map of Heaven uh, it came out about two years after Proof of Heaven. Um, and really, I, th I think some of the power of Map of Heaven must understand, you know, I've been, uh, I'm about seven years out plus from this experience. I'm still on a vertical part of the learning curve. And I, I, I don't think I'll, I'll get remotely 
uh, get this all figured out in this lifetime. I mean, this is a very deep and challenging uh, set of issues to come to an understanding of. Um, and so it really has been a journey of uh, deeper understanding. Part of the benefit I get is by giving uh, you know several talks a week on average, um, I encounter thousands and thousands out there, seekers, journeyers, people who've had their own experiences. And so that was part of, of the map of heaven. I wanted to point out, we're not just talking about the occasional book, you know, that gets to the top of the New York Times bestseller list about a near-death experience. We're really talking about the experience of all of humanity. Uh, and you really have to explain all those millions of experiences that are out there if you want to have a satisfactory explanation. And uh, Map of Heaven is very much about that. I bring up a lot of the stories that people have shared with me on the road, showing that these experiences are extremely common. They're the rule, not the exception. Now, the other thing is uh, my growth has a lot to do with my assimilating my scientific understanding of the nature of the world with... Um, my experience and my understanding and worldview. Uh, and that has uh, upshifted dramatically over the years and is still in the process of growing. I also came to realize that much of my personal struggle to understand this is absolutely uh, right aligned with the deep struggle of our modern science to come to a deeper understanding of the nature of reality and having to struggle and wrestle and reject pure physicalism or materialism as completely inadequate. Uh, and so in essence, what I'm going through personally is deeply related with what the scientific community and therefore our modern 21st century world is going through in its understanding of the nature of reality. This is the part that is going to be so fundamental and revolutionary because the old materialism is going down. It's coming to an end because it's, it's kind of like saying the earth is flat or the sun goes around the earth. And the more people look at the evidence, the more they realize that's ridiculous. That pure materialism is a complete dead end. Uh, and when you look at the hard problem of consciousness, you come to realize it's the biggest smoke and mirrors trick of all of 20th uh, century science and early 21st century science is that people still buy into the fact of believing the material is the only thing that exists. And in fact, my coma journey showed me very clearly you have to flip it around 180 degrees that the thing that exists is spirit, soul, consciousness, the divine. That's absolutely rock solid real. And that is what generates all the rest of this, all the material world emerges from that consciousness. And this is where the scientific world is growing up. And there are two beautiful books uh, from uh, Ed, Ed Kelly and the group at the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies, for those interested in the science, they're listed on my website, evanalexander.com, on the recommended reading list. Uh, but one of them is Irreducible Mind for the Psychology right, of the right. 20th Century. That's mentioned in Proof of Heaven. The other one is their follow-up book, which came out February 2015. It's called Beyond Physicalism Toward Reconciliation of Science and Spirituality. These are some of the deepest scientific works I know on this very deep uh, and challenging question of the mind-body relationship. Right, right. And for me too, I definitely see this, you know, science headed in this direction, you know, just a lot of the things that I see coming out and um, different people in authority in, in the science world, you know, are writing these books about consciousness and uh, just different understandings of quantum theory. And just, um, it's been very eye-opening even for me, you know. Yeah, well, so, I think the science brings a lot to it. And that's an important part of this is we're all seeking one truth. And that truth has to be consistent with science and with all of our knowing of everything else about reality we can bring to the table. Uh, and that's why uh, this incredible revolution that is absolutely rejecting the simplistic kindergarten level thinking of materialism, of conventional science, is long overdue. Right, right, right. So, so what, what's next for you these days? I mean, are well, you going to be working uh, on another book or... Yes, my life partner, Karen Newell, who uh, is one of the co-founders of Sacred Acoustics, and I are busy writing a third book, which really uh, we hope to put all this in much stronger perspective. But the, the first two books, although they kind of hint at where all this is going, they don't kind of put it all together in the way that I think is crucial to help wake this world up. Uh, and so we're very busy working on that uh, book right now. We go around the world giving presentations uh, to help people get into deep meditative states. And again, those who are interested should go to sacredacoustics.com. But uh, this is all about waking this world up. Deep meditation, coming to realize 
that unconditional love has infinite power to heal and that each and every one of us are eternal, divine, spiritual beings, all interconnected as one. We're all in this together. Oh, that's exciting. And yes, it is very exciting. How, how, how can my listeners keep in touch with you? What's your website? The best thing is to visit ebenalexander.com. That's E-B-E-N alexander.com. Uh, and uh, they can reach out to me through that. I would also recommend people who are interested go to eternia, E-T-E-R-N-E-A dot org, uh, a great site with lots of information. They can tell their stories there. Uh, also, go to, for those interested in near-death experiences, go to I-A-N-D-S dot org. That's the International Association of Near-Death Studies, I-A-N-D-S dot org. Very informative site, uh, very important to help wake people up to go to these major sites uniting uh, science and spirituality. Nice, nice. So be sure to check out Eben's books, Proof of Heaven and A Map of Heaven on Amazon.com. Uh, but if you like listening to audiobooks like me, remember I teamed up with Audible.com. You can download any of his books absolutely free with a free 30-day trial just so you can check it out. That's uh, www.audibletrial.com slash flipside. And if you'd like to support the show financially and help keep it going, that would really mean a lot. You can go to www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Joshua Tongle. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, write a review and rate it on iTunes. It only takes like two minutes, guys, because it'll help more people discover the show. Plus, it encourages me a lot, too, because I read every single one of them. And of course, please share this podcast with your friends. And so, Eben, I know you got to go. It's been a very inspiring interview and very informative. I really appreciate your time. And so thanks so much for being on the show. Well, thanks so much for having me. Awesome, awesome. Alrighty, guys. Once again, thanks for listening, and I'll catch you guys on the flip side. I'm out. Peace. Peace.